Hey, good morning, Encounter. Hey, it's great to see you this morning. And those of you that volunteered last night at the Fall Festival, thanks so much for all you did to help us impact the community. It was super fun to see all of the different costumes and ways to dress up. And if you happen to be here today visiting us from last night, thanks for joining us. I know Eric and Sophia already mentioned it. I'm just going to reiterate how excited we are for next weekend. Um, whether you got friends, family, extended family, you just need to get out of the house. Pancake breakfast at 9 a.m. tomorrow or next week. It's all together service here at 10. We are looking forward to it. I'm specifically looking forward to it because I'm still in my year of first around Encounter. So this is the first all together I get to witness. And I get to see how it's always interesting how our some of the cultural nuances of our 9 a.m. service and the 1045 service, we're going to bridge those together and see what happens. It's going to be a great, great time. And John is going to be launching a whole new series for a month. I'm going to give you a little sneak peek. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I can't do that. I was, I was demand to secrecy on that. But one of the things that we at Encounter really, really care about is our community. We really care about connecting a community together. So whether it's connected to, uh, to women's ministry or men's ministry, student ministry, groups, or Sunday morning gatherings, and one of the in insights I'm going to give you is we're going to really invite during this series, what does it look like to do community together? And so if you have been a part of a small group, thanks so much for uh, caring enough about the community to do that. I'm going to encourage you that if you've been maybe missing some small group gatherings or it hasn't been as consistent, what would that look like to finish 2024 really, really well? And if you, back in the fall, never really risked being a part of a small group, we're actually launching a six-week small group starting November 11th just for the rest of 2024. It's going to be on Monday nights here on campus. So if that's an intrigue to you this week or as you hear it next weekend, let me know. would love to connect you to that. As we think about today, um, I've got an invitation for us. Um, I'm going to ask that you go with me on the Lord's Prayer. Um, now, whether you're from an atheistic or a Catholic or a Protestant background or you've ever been to a funeral, my guess is you've heard this prayer before. And so I want to invite us to look at two specific lines of this prayer today. Uh, but in those two lines, before we get into it, um, I want to play a little bit with this idea of what does culture look like? If you talk to sociologists, there's really five things that define culture, and here's what they are. First one is this, norms. Rules that guide how people behave and interact. Values. Ideals that guide individuals' actions and decisions. Beliefs. Ideas and convictions that individuals hold to. Language. Ways of community values, ways of community values, beliefs, and customs. And then artifacts and expressive symbols, items that represent and contain information about the people and the culture they relate to. Now, it's, uh, it's organizations, it's families, it's sports teams. How about them Dodgers? Right? There's culture. There's culture to so much of our life. And if you are in the business world or if you're familiar with systems way of operating, you know the name um, uh, Peter Drucker. And uh, he wrote the famous quote, culture is what eats strategy for breakfast. See, culture is what happens when a group of people spend time together. Culture is one of those um, intangible things that when you have a group of people together, it forms out of it. Here's some cultural nuances of the Bowers household. We would rather have hard conversations than no conversations. We value time together in outdoor spaces. We have a belief that each of us has gifts and talents that we get to experience from each other. We have an obligation to share that with each other. We yell loudly for each other, not at each other. Those are some cultural nuances of our house. And whenever you think about culture, it's the intangible feeling you get if you go to a different region or state or country. And things may occur to you as like, oh, this is different. But it's a total norm there. That's part of the culture. There's the different culture if you go over to someone's house and you have a meal with them and how they do meals or where they sit at the table or even how they do family gatherings. That's a different culture for that family. Culture is what occurs when a group of people gather together. And it happens in belief centers. It happens in faith communities. In fact, if you're here today and you're not connected to encounter, or you're not connected to maybe a way of following Jesus, there are certain cultural nuances that are odd to you. Like what we just got done doing, music. What is this raising of hands thing? What is this singing of songs I used to do, I'm, us, I'm usually doing that at a concert or in my car, but here with this group of people, 
or prayer. I actually have a friend who's not a follower of Jesus, and prayer is a, something he is not accustomed to in faith environments. Culture is one of those pieces that when we actually, and here's a side note, if you're a believer and follower of Jesus, it is actually a great gift we have to our neighbors to let them process, to be curious, to ask questions, not overwhelm them. Let them seek information as they want and not just like, here, here's what you got to do. See, when we invite ourselves to a way of being and we understand that the cultural nuances that we have in 2024 are different than the first century of where we're going to read scripture from today, we have to shift a little bit of our brain. We have to shift a little bit of our understanding, and we can't take and project how it should be. But what is the invitation Jesus has for us here in 2024 from a first century text? Now, this morning, we're going to look at two specific lines. And in those two lines, my invitation to you is, how would this shape and shift me? So before we do that, I would love to read this, and I'd love for you to read along with me. So it's going to be Matthew 6, verses 6 through 13. It will be up on the screen. You're also going to follow along on the Bible in the front if you want to. And you may read with me, starting verse 6. It says, But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray... Do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Check out this 60-second video. The Sermon on the Mount is one of the most important collections of the teachings of Jesus. And it has three parts, an introduction, a main body, and a conclusion. Now, the main body is the central part of the sermon. And in it, Jesus calls his followers to live by a higher standard of right relationships with God and with other people. And the main body itself has three parts, looking at this righteousness from three perspectives. Now, this central part here is about how righteousness should be expressed in the religious practices of Jesus' day. And this section also has three parts. In the middle, Jesus addresses three religious practices. And the central practice that he highlights is prayer. Ah, this is where Jesus teaches his disciples the Lord's Prayer. You got it. So the Lord's Prayer is at the center of the center of the center of the entire Sermon on the Mount. And it's here because Jesus wants this prayer to have a central place in the lives of his followers. So in the central space of the lives of his followers for us to follow Jesus, here's what we're going to look at today. First one is Matthew 6, verse um, 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, this model of prayer is actually a model of way of aligning with the call of Jesus. And in that model of prayer, it's a way for us to align to say, how would I approach my day when I trust that what I need is going to be given to me? Now, I love tracking certain things, as in it's 59 days from today till Christmas morning. You are welcome. Best season on the planet. And in our culture, and in we, it doesn't take much for us to see wishes and wants and desires and drives and, and things that may fill the want bucket. Uh, my sister was visiting last weekend with two nephews and a niece, and I forgot how with little kids, they're seven, five, and two, how much I want more, give me, now comes out of the mouths of little kids. It's really not much different than college-age kids. It's just usually associated with money. It's just a different, like, food versus money. It shifts and shapes itself. But when we think about it, we have a culture that we can get sucked and lulled into that, like, oh, what is more that I need to go after? Now, the invitation is not that you cannot want, you cannot dream, you cannot have desires. I'm a dreamer. I love visions. I love thinking ahead. I love planning ahead. I love being able to know exactly where I'm going to be, when I'm going to be there. But this invitation of give us our daily bread is centered around this one word. The Greek word is epiousios. 
It is actually, in, in Greek writing, there's a lot of words that can have parallel meanings, but this is not one of those words. This word means exactly this, daily. Another way to say it is, what is the necessity of my daily need daily? See, when we think about this, give us our daily bread, what Jesus is inviting the disciples and us as we read it into is, in you living today, what is it that is needed? What is it that is needed? See, we can have those wants. We can look ahead to the future. And the moment that we're in today is about that, the moment of need. And when we sit in the moment of need, what Jesus is inviting us into is, do you trust that what you need today will be given to you? Jesus is not saying that we cannot plan, that we cannot think ahead. And if you were to look at my calendar, in fact, here's a really fun practice. If you know Lindsay Lopez, go ask her about how she views my calendar. Because I have seven calendars. They're all color co coordinated. I love to be really intentional about what I'm doing when I'm doing it. Not only do I love being really intentional about what I'm doing when I'm doing it, I can tell you right now, next Sunday, what my day is going to look like. The problem is this. Danny doesn't live a week from today. Danny lives right now. And in planning and thinking ahead, and my fellow like planners out there, I know you feel this, there is something comfort about seeing something on a calendar or knowing where you're going to be when you're going to be there and going, oh, cool, there's a control factor. There's a comfort factor. There is a planning factor. Some of you that when you go, what's your day? When I ask the question, how's your day going? You're like, I don't know. I don't even know what I'm going to do today. I cringe inside for you. <laughs> like, how do you do that? You know, the people are like, oh, we just rolled out of bed, didn't really have a plan for a Saturday. I'm like, what? That's wasted time. But when we are living today, the invitation of Jesus is, what is your daily bread? What is, in this moment, in this unique space, in October 27th of 2024, what is it that you need and you trust that the need will be provided? Because even the planner and me can think ahead time and time and time again. But I'm not living in the future, I'm living now. And if now is a gift, do I trust that that gift is good from a loving, resurrected Jesus who claims life over death for me? I woke up at 5.52. It's now 11.16. What has been a good gift for you already? See, that's the imitation of Jesus. Jesus. What has been a good gift for you already? Can you look at whatever's gone on from the time you woke up to now and go, God, thank you so much. That was a gift. Because I trust you for what I need. And in when we trust for what we need, and Jesus is going to promise that what we need is what we're going to get, do we celebrate that? Because for us, we can go in the grocery store and go down the cereal aisle and see 15,000 options. But in most of the world, and in this statement in the first century, just getting a meal is survival. So how do we allow not the culture we live in to shape what needs really mean and are defined by, but that we trust that Jesus is going to do something in us and through us when we trust what he offers us, and can we celebrate it? As I shared, the Bowers fa family really loves outdoor experiences. And we um, would go camping with our kids as one of our favorite memories. And we still talk about this day. We were living in Southern California, and we are going to go to Yosemite. We camped in Wawona, which is outside the valley. It's one of our favorite camping sites. I can tell you the exact best bites, sites to use, by the way. And we packed the vehicle, and um, we had a little 05 Highlander. And we just knew there was going to be, uh, we're there for eight or nine days, and we needed a little bit more. So I borrowed a space saver topper from a friend, one of the things that goes right on top of your vehicle. Packed it all up. We got up super early, drove up to the campsite, pulled in. And like little boys do, they just jumped out of the vehicle. Every branch became a sword. Every pine cone became a bomb. And they were just like having fun. Well, this person doesn't start camping until the campsite is set up, the hammock is set up, and I'm sitting in it and the book's in my hand. So what do I do? As they're running around, I'm going to get everything loaded. So I go to unopen the space topper which was a problem because I wore jeans the night before when I loaded it, and I put shorts on in the morning. So the keys that had the lock in it, still in the jeans. Not a problem. I'm a pretty good MacGyver. I go to grab my tool bag, which I always travel with, which is in the space topper. So like the good Boy Scout I am, I grab my Gerber with like the wasted saw. 
not anymore. I value that saw on that thing. And I spent an hour and a half sawing through the dense plastic around the lock to trip the lock. Y'all caught the fact to borrow this, right? In my head the whole time, I'm like, Tom Norheim is not going to forgive me. I tried to save money. Now I've got to replace this. And I was not the dad or husband you want to be around in that moment because I'm frustrated. It's ruined camping. And things aren't set up yet. I'm not in my hammock yet. And I just broke this. And I almost cut myself three times with a saw. And why did I pack the tool bag in the space hopper and not in the Highlander? And why did I change, put shorts on? Why? Because it's warm as opposed to the jeans. These are all the thoughts that are going through my head. I can relay them to you to this day. And I'll never forget my wife when she goes, you're in the mountains. You're camping. What is your problem? And I think there's times, yes, Jesus' voice does sound like my wife sometimes. <laughs> because there are times where we need to be said something and told something to wake us up to the reality that what are we really griping about? See, I'm able to look at one of my favorite scenes, which is streams and trees and mountains. I'm watching two kids who I love dearly just play and have fun. I have everything I need in a vehicle I drove there with safety on the road. We were able to stop and grab Chick-fil-A for lunch on the way up. Like, what does it look like to just trust and go, these are gifts to us? As opposed to worried about what's next. And I think the culture that we live in often sucks us into the more and the next and the to do as opposed to do we just stop ever and go, Jesus, thanks for the gift of now. And in the gift of now, are we able to celebrate that what we need is provided by a loving, good, gracious God, even when it feels like it's the last penny or the last morsel or the last meeting or the last whatever, but do we trust that what we have in this moment, in this time today, we've got what we need? And this part of this prayer messes with me. It messes with me because I have to remind myself that tomorrow is not promised. I have today. And in today, I don't want to lay my head on a pillow tonight and go, well, uh, did I really do anything today? But did I pause and just go, Jesus, thank you. Thanks for, tr thanks for being the God of the universe that no matter what I'm dealing with today, there's a need and you're going to provide it even in the unknown of tomorrow. I'm going to trust that you're going to give it to me. This prayer is a central teaching of Jesus. And in the central teaching of Jesus, there's an invitation to trust and trust and faith and faith and trust. They go synonymously. And the power of the resurrected Christ reminds us that in the moment... Jesus also invites us to be a body of people, of believers, that we bring hope and healing to a broken world. And in that hope and healing, when we live this out, you know what that is influential is? It's influential that when people go, how are you not freaking out over everything? It's like, I honestly, I, I'm trusting. That is a great gospel opportunity and narrative to be able to say, hey, I just live in a different way. I'm going to be okay living counterculturally. History. Human nature shows us that it's really easy to hoard and grasp and get and obtain and go after. And there is nothing in scripture that, does, that says you cannot be driven. You cannot be visionary. You cannot seek to impact the kingdom in the way you can. But at the end of the day, you have today. And in today, do you trust that what Jesus is doing is enough that it's a good gift? The line of this prayer shifts for me my beliefs, my behaviors, my values. Because if I'm going to trust that Jesus defeated death, I'm going to definitely trust he's going to provide me for what I need today. I have a question for you on this line. It's this. If today is a gift, what are you thankful for that has been provided to you already? From the moment you woke up to this moment right now in this service, what is a gift that you can be thankful for? Whether you have your phone out, pen and paper, or just a mental thought, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. For some of you, this is going to be awkward silence. Heads up. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to actually capture that. Go for it.
For some of you, that was a really long 30 seconds, I know. Uh, this bowl was given to me as a, a friend. He's just a wood, he's a craftsman, he's a woodworker, and he spun this bowl for me, and I've had different, used it for various things. It sits in my office now. If you ever walk by, um, you'll see it there. And inside of it, um, there's slips of paper. And on Tuesday, our business team, that's uh, Robert Warren, Kelly Ann, Judy Fallman, uh, Lori B., myself, Victoria Carpenter, um, we meet and talk through everything going on around campus, logistically, financially, projects, um, work orders, um, all the little things. And there's times where before we start the meeting, I'll ask everybody to grab a slip of paper and date it and just like, where did you see Jesus show up in the last week? So we write them down, put it in the bowl. Uh, about every six weeks, um, we pull them out and we just read them. Here's why. It reminds us of the goodness of God showing up. Um, I've done this in various ways with my kids. I've done it in various ways with friends. And I would encourage you that if you need something to center you on how is today a good gift, to do a practice like this. Use the notes app on your phone. Use a checklist. Use pens and paper. Post-it notes are fantastic for it. And invite those that you do community with into this. What does it look like just to pause and say, hey, how is today a good gift? So Jesus, I trust you that when things get hard, I'm going to trust that you're going to give me what I need. Sometimes acting on it allows us to remember all those little ways. Second line of this uh, prayer we're going to look at. But before we go there, I need a heads up. This may mess with some of you. I love you, but it, it may mess with you. And that's okay. Check out this picture. Told you, love the outdoors. Here's what Danny sees. Adventure opportunity, streams, hikes, mountains, fly fishing pools. What is out there? What opportunity and possibility could there be? What bears will I run into? What deer can I scout? What eagles are going to be flying over? How big is that brook trout? Am I going to land on a little white fly? All those things I see. I'm wired that when I look at opportunity, I see possibility. I see adventure. I see what could not be. Some of you I know are not that way. You think of new ideas and you enter with trepidation. You have 9,282 questions before you even want to take a step. I'm asking one question and then leaping. That's why I love skydiving. Who wants to jump out of a perfectly airplane? This guy does. Who wants to go on an adventure? Yes. Someone on our staff, I won't th name them names, is like, hey, uh, we need to deliver some goods to a missionary partner. Do you want to go? Sure, buy them a ticket. Let's go. I'll go in my backpack. I'll meet you at the plane. Passport's good. I'm wired that way. And in being wired that way, there are moments and opportunities where Jesus invites us into transformational things. When we approach those, often the first step is like, this is going to be amazing. Cannot wait. It's usually like three, four steps in where the thing all of a sudden is like, Ugh. I did not see this going this way. Here's a really good example. Seven months ago, when my wife and I packed up to move to Ventura, our thoughts were, this is going to be fantastic. We did not approach this like, oh, this is not going to go well, but we're going to go through it with it anyway. It's like, no, this is going to be fantastic. This is a fantastic opportunity. And in your life, in my life, it may be two, three steps into the thing before we get unsettled, before it's uncomfortable, before there's a bit of us that gets a little in the stomach. When was the last time you took an intentional step to pursue growth and transformation. For some of you, you may be wrestling with a job change right now, a new relationship, a new community relationship. There may be something happening in you right now that is a shift and you don't know how it's going to go. Are you looking at it as an intentional step of transformation? Read with me, Matthew 6, verse 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I said earlier that there are certain Greek words that have parallel meanings, and temptation is one of them. The Greek word is actually this, parasmos, which does translate as temptation, but it also translates as trial and test. And over the years, this has been a fun scholar theolo theology debate over what word is best fit here, and it's a 50-50 split. Because it actually aligns in trial and test clearer. Another way to read this is, and lead us not into the trial, but deliver us from the evil one. See, the reason I said some of you may not like this, because there are reality of the world we live in, and the reality of an invitation with Jesus, that he invites us to transformation. 
See, status quo and settling is not something Jesus invites us to because in this side of heaven, there is a brokenness because of sin between humanity and between God and God and Jesus is constantly going, I want to invite you into transformation to live out thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. See, the preceding part of that passage is what invites us that when we face trials, not if, it's when. That when we face trials, there's an invitation that we listen to Jesus' voice that as we go through the trial for transformation, that we line and look more like what Jesus' kingdom would look like. And we're invited to share that with others. That the weight of the trial and the test is actually about our own formation and growth. And we actually see this all through scripture. The difference in 2024 is we have hindsight. We get to read the scriptures and go, oh my goodness, do you see the trial that Abraham went through? Yeah, he had such faith. Hey, did you see the trial that Peter went through? Oh, such faith. Hey, did you see the trial Mary went through? Such faith. But when we go through trials, we wrestle with it. When we go through trials, it's like, well, why me? When we go through trials, is when's this going to end? When we go through trials, what we often don't do is we don't go, hey, Jesus, how are you forming me into maturity? See, the invitation of the Lord's Prayer at the central of one of Jesus' most central teachings is that when we go through trials, we invite God's voice to lead us to look more like him. That we're led to be more like a community that reflects the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven, even amidst the trials. And I know the weight of some of you in this room, medically, relationally, maritally, family, financially, business, there's a weight. There is a trial that many of you are facing right now. Are you inviting Jesus to grow you through it? Often, if we listen to our language around trials, we want rescue. Save us from it. Remove it. What would it look like if the language around our prayers around trials was, Jesus, grow me through this. Jesus, refine me through this. Jesus transform me through this. Told you, some of you aren't going to like this line. Um, this is so much part of my story. And this is so much part of your story. Because in the daily bread that we trust Jesus for, we also trust him for the voice he'll have in the trial. The God of the universe who resurrected himself from the dead to redeem us from life is never going to tempt you into something that you cannot handle. Because that is not God's nature, to tempt you. It is clear that Jesus allows testings to happen. We believe in the scriptures. We see it in the scriptures. He invites that for maturity and growth. He invites it for trust. He invites us to remind us that we are a finite being created in his image, that we need a resurrected Savior. That we are not God, that he is God. And in trusting him as God, we trust him even in the midst of the trial. Instead of asking Jesus to rescue you from trials, what if you asked him to grow you through it? See, the Jesus who says his love will never give up is the Jesus who will meet you in that trial. The Jesus who says you'll never be forgotten will meet you in that trial. The Jesus who says his grace is enough will meet you in that trial. The Jesus who says, whatever you need today, trust that I'll be giving it to you. And it's what you need, not always what you want. The Jesus who says, we, as a community of believers, are called to have the opportunity to impact the world around us for his kingdom. We are walked with. And I want to be really clear. This is not trivializing the challenges of life. It is the reminder and the invitation that when we go through those challenges, we believe based on Jesus' death and resurrection that he is with us in them regardless of what's going on. And it's why we believe in community. Because when Jesus said, here's the prayer for the disciples, it was not to pray this alone. It was to pray this in community. Because in community, when you're going through a trial, we go through a trial. In community, when you're asking for a daily need, we ask for the daily need. 
It's why we gather on Sundays. It's why we gather in groups. It's why we gather with students. It's why we gather with men and we gather with women and we gather together and we gather in singles and marrieds and young families and old families and challenges and grief and everywhere and every spot of life we gather together so we are not alone. And if you're here today and you're going through a daily need ask and you're going through a trial and you're doing it alone, you're robbing the community around you from being invited to the journey with you. Because when Jesus moves in a way of formation in you, he moves in a way of formation in us. In a culture that loves the individuality of what are you doing in life, being countercultural with Jesus is trusting for the daily need. Being countercultural with Jesus is saying, I am not good enough to do this on my own. I actually want people around me. I want people to share in the journey. I want people to know me. And what that looks like to each of us is unique, but the invitation is there. So I have a closing thought, and it's this. If something struck with you today, I'm going to presume that it was probably related to either a trust factor or a direction factor. Jacob's going to come out and we're going to lead in a final song. But in the final song, I would invite you to sit with that. Do you trust Jesus for the daily need? Do you trust Jesus for the direction? If you're like me, um, sometimes having something tangible as a takeaway is nice. So I'm going to give you two uh, QR codes right now on the screen. If you're a reader, this is a book I'd recommend. It's called Sermon on the Mount. It's by wonderful theologian and scholar Scott McKnight. You can find it on Amazon. I would highly encourage you to read it. If you're like, words are hard, I need pictures, this, is the, this link's for you. The little 60-second video that you clipped, um, there's actually a whole journey through the Lord's Prayer by Bible Project. They're one of my favorite resources. If you've known me for six months, you know I've probably encouraged you to check this out. But what if you took the next seven days and looked at the seven statements of the Lord's Prayer? Because that's how many there are. There's seven. This is a resource you can do from both a visual, they have content, resources. But I'd invite you to that. And as I invite you to do that, I invite you to stand to read the Lord's Prayer with me one more time before Jacob leads this song. And I'm going to invite you not to rush through this. Read it with me. Our Father in heaven, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let me pray. Jesus. The fact that you resurrected from the dead is where we put our faith in you. And in that faith, we trust that no matter what's going on, you got us. You have us in the daily needs and asks. You have us in what could be around the corner. You have us in the trials that we go through. And you are there every step of the way. So as we trust you in that, here's what we know. We know we're not alone. So right now in this space, I would ask that whatever we're holding on to, we give you space to speak to it. That we would trust you for the needs that we have. And we trust you for the direction through where we're going. In your resurrected name we pray.